If you like our content, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking that subscribe button. We really appreciate it. And for more strategic tips on international tax and wealth planning, subscribe to our email list and follow us on LinkedIn. Links are below. Hello and welcome to our latest video. How do I get money out of my trust? This is a great question and a question that clients contemplating trusts often have. Generally clients know it's a good idea to have a trust because of asset protection, estate planning, succession planning, privacy, tax benefits they can offer. But a lot of times they don't understand how to get money out of their trust and that's obviously a primary concern because they want to be able to benefit from their money. So I'm going to be answering that question in this video. Before we get into it though, if you haven't watched our Introduction to Trust or Introduction to Foundations video, I would urge you to do so so that you're familiar with some of the terminology. In this video, unless you're already well versed on you know, who the settler and a beneficiary and trustees and stuff like that are, in which case, watch on, the link is below. Uh, as always, before we get into the material, a disclaimer. This presentation is prepared for education purposes only. This presentation is not legal, tax, or any other type of advice. Each individual circumstances are different. You should seek legal and or tax advice to address any specific questions you may have. Now, let's get into it. So, the first way to get money out of your trust is, in most jurisdictions, you can be a beneficiary of your trust, which means that you can receive distributions of your trust from your trust, distributions of cash, for example, or you can also have the benefit of using trust property. So for example, if the trust owned a home, you could use that home as a beneficiary. You have to be aware in both cases, whether it's receiving distributions or using trust property, depending on your country of residence um, and whether or not the trust has income within it, those benefits may be taxable. So if you receive a distribution, that might be taxable, or the value of the use of the property that you as a beneficiary get to use, that could also be taxable. Now, if you want even more security, I mean, a lot of people use what are called discretionary trusts, which, meaning, which means the trustee gets to decide which beneficiaries get what and how much. That might not provide enough financial security for you, in which case, you have a lot of latitude in dictating the distribution provisions within your trust. So for example, you could say that during your lifetime, all distributions need to be made to you or, or all distributions need to be made to you and your spouse, for example. Or maybe you don't wanna distribute any of the assets you put in the trust and you just wanna distribute income that the assets generate throughout your lifetime. So you could put in a provision, for example, to say, okay, all income can only be distributed to me during my lifetime. While this does provide some extra financial security for you, that you're gonna get the benefit of the funds that, that are in your trust, it does also pose some asset protection and tax risks. And the reason why is these fixed distributions can be viewed by courts to be an asset, right? And they could particular, they could, be used, for example, to satisfy judgments or debts or something like that. Likewise, the tax authorities might look at that as owning a, a, a part of the, the trust assets, which can also you know, generate some negative tax consequences. So I'm generally not a huge fan of fixed distributions, at least not by themselves. If you couple them with a protector provision, for example, and a protector is somebody who can have certain rights and powers, right? So you can say, well, all distributions can only go to me during my lifetime, but the protector who's an independent third party, who could be a friend or a lawyer or another family member or something like that, the protector has to consent to the distribution, right? So even if the trustee orders the distribution, unless the protector consents, the distribution can't get made. That gives sort of an extra layer of protection However, if you do that, it's important that the protector be in a different jurisdiction than the trustees and probably even yourself so that the same court doesn't have jurisdiction over the protector and the trustees, right? You wanna split those powers to give you more asset protection benefits. If you're using a private trust company, which is basically a company that you set up for the sole purpose of managing your trust, 
In some cases, the settler of the trust also serves as a trust, uh, sorry, as a director of the private trust company. In that case, if you are the sole board member or you control the board, you can basically order distributions to yourself. Again, that poses some asset protection risks though, because if you had some debts or a judgment against you or something like that, a judge could simply order you to distribute money to yourself. So I'm generally not a huge fan of giving people too much control to distribute to themselves. I like, but I understand that people need security. So I think splitting it up with a strong protective provision is, is, is obviously a, a good choice and provides some flexibility and protection and financial security. I think it's the best of all worlds. So one way of getting money out of your trust is to be a beneficiary where you can get distributions or use trust property. Another way is to earn trustee fees. You serving as a board member of a private trust company. So if you're using a private trust company, the trust can pay trustee fees to the private trust company and the private trust company can then in turn pay the directors, which may include you, director's fees. Now you need to be aware that those director's fees will be income and will likely be taxable in your country of residence if you live in a country with income taxes. You will also need to be careful that if you're managing your private trust company from your country of residence, it could create um, a permanent establishment or the country could argue that the private trust company itself has become a tax resident of the country that you're managing it from because it's centrally controlled and managed from there. So you need to be careful from which country you're managing your private trust company and just be aware that you are, if you are receiving director's fees, those may be taxable in your country of residence. Um, again, as I mentioned before, serving as a director, especially the sole director of a PTC can have some asset protection risks because like I mentioned, a court could order you to distribute money to yourself. The tax authorities could also argue that um, the assets and income within the trust should be attributed to you and therefore you should have to pay tax on them. Again, both of those risks can usually be mitigated with strong protector provisions and giving the protector the power um, where the protector's consent is required in order for distributions to take place. Another way that you can receive money out of your trust is through investment advisor fees. So a lot of times trust agreements will be drafted with a provision that says the trustees are required to consult an investment advisor when making investment decisions. Now you can be the investment advisor and you can charge fees for providing your investment advisor services. Again, those fees will be income to you. And if you live in a country with income taxes will likely be subject to income tax in your country of residence, but it is a way that you can get money out of your trust. And the final way that you can get money out of your trust is through director's fees. So typically when we structure a trust, we don't just put all the assets into the trust. And the reason we don't is for asset protection reasons, right? Because if some liability arises out of one asset and the trust gets sued, all the assets in the trust are at risk. So what we normally do is silo the assets in different intermediate companies, right? So you put each property in a different company, you put liquid assets in a different company, and you kind of break up these assets to give you extra asset protection. Well, if you are a director of these companies, you can charge director's fees for your services and be compensated by those companies for your director services. Again, that is going to be income to you. And if you live in a country with income taxes, you're most likely going to be taxed on those director fees that you receive. Again, you need to be careful of creating a permanent establishment of those companies that you're, that you're managing as a director by managing them within your country of residence. So, you know, for example, if you had a company set up here in the, in the UAE, that was one of your holding companies, but you're managing it from the UK, for example, not only is the UK going to tax the director's fees that you get, but the UK could argue that, well, hey, you're centrally managing and controlling this UAE company from within the UK. Therefore, 
it's actually a UK resident company and we can tax its activities. So if you are doing, uh, serving as a director and you are providing management functions, you want to make sure that you're providing those management functions in the country where the, where the company is incorporated. So in this case, in my example, the UAE. So I hope you found this information useful and has explained to you how you can get money out of your trust. I know that is something near and dear to everybody's heart who's contemplating setting up a trust. Thank you so much for watching. If you need to contact us, you can do so here. Thank you.